In the rush to make amends for perceived disparities in the treatment of people in, let's say, America, there is a contingent of well-meaning people who are largely white and largely white women who are adopting uh, certain strains of rhetoric that we've seen played out on my channel and that I've been uh, dissecting and intersecting with uh, various critiques on this channel. And we can think of that loosely as the privilege doctrine, which states that uh, white people, specifically white male people, specifically certain categories who are overrepresented, bear a certain uh, amount of blame for the underrepresentation and the discrimination because of the underrepresentation of other categories of groups. Now, the privilege doctrine basically states that you assign yourself a certain category of being, of existential being in this, uh, in this way of organizing society, and then you devote yourself to reversing that role in some way. Now, at the furthest extent of this doctrine, when it becomes so full of itself and so full of energy, it devolves into what I've called uh, this, this dual uh, morality play, where you have the virtuous victorious victim and the obsequious oppressor. And the obsequious oppressor is largely construed to be the white man. So what happened at the Evergreen State College was that as a white man, I was called upon to listen and then to speak in support. Now, I'm, I'm speaking about this right now because as a white man, I was told on a social media platform that I need to speak and use my privilege to support the other groups, the groups that is called the people of color. Now, what that assumes that I have the capacity to do is rather arrogant on one hand and uh, patronizing on the other. I, I need to be incredibly arrogant to take upon myself the mantle of the white man, whatever that category means. And I don't really understand what it actually means to be a white man and to speak as a white man. What does that actually um, constitute? And if I am the, uh, the oppressor, then would not me speaking as a white man be me speaking as an oppressor and to speak oppressively towards other people to fully fulfill the role of the white man? Or am I supposed to fulfill the role of the white man going down a notch and becoming subservient and, and uh, representing a certain sort of bowing down of authority um, from, you know, all this historical trauma or this historical privilege that I've accumulated in my role as a white man. So that, that's the arrogant part, that I have the arrogance to assume all of that oppression um, and, and the power to speak for every white man in all of history. The patronizing side of that is that I need to assume the capacity to speak to people of color as people of color. In this very transaction, I am reducing those people who I'm supposedly talking to as people of color into their race. And what gives me the ability to do that? And then I would have to assume in doing that, that they want me to submit, that they want to hear me uh, laying down my authority as a white man, and that they will somehow achieve some sort of grace through that transaction. A video surfaced yesterday of a group of white people bowing down before uh, black people, of uh, white people bowing down before black people, and then the black people accepting the bowing down, and then they all bow down in front of God. Humbling ourselves before you. Yes, Lord. You brought the thunder and rain today, God. Because Satan takes the L today. Father, in Jesus' name, you get the victory. Father, we ask for forgiveness from our black brothers and sisters for years and years of racism, of systematic racism. As you are the God of reconciliation, not only, not only do we receive their repentance, but God, we repent as the black community. Yes for 
for holding unforgiveness, yes. for acting out of anger, yes. for, Father God, failing our own community at times, yes. for God, every... And that religious ceremony... It, it's it's cringy on one level, it's disturbing on another, it's very religious on a still other level, but in the end, what does that actually do? Now, if I come in humility as a white man, which I have a problem maintaining humility and assuming that I have the capacity to represent white men, and then it's another uh, violation of what I think of as humility to reduce everybody that I'm speaking to as representative of their race or of a race or of a certain narrative that I impose upon them and impose upon myself. So if I can do that transaction with humility, enter into that transaction, uh, transaction and humble myself and through humbling myself, humble the representation of the white man, I, I'm still re relying on them, the, the other group, entering into that humbly themselves and then helping me somehow complete that transaction in mutual forgiveness and healing. That That's a big ask. And furthermore, what does it actually do? How does it actually change anything? It, it, it releases a certain amount of uh, narrative tension in this uh, United States story of uh, oppression and freedom that we're all participating in. But what does it actually do in the long run? It allows me to save face and to gain grace as a humble white man, as what they call an ally. But what if the best way for me to support this so-called other community is to maintain my skepticism and my critical thinking through the process and not to enter into these symbolic actions that have religious significance in this in this worldview that we're acting out. But what if I stand back and my support is actually critical? What I perceive um, the underlying ask for me when somebody asks me as a white man to show my support for people of color, I see uh, underneath that is that I need to enter into this story, agree with this story, agree with this ritual of submitting myself and being submitted to this act of forgiveness or this release from these change of chains of bondage. But what if that isn't what is actually going to matter in the long run? Can people accept that perhaps your greatest supporter is your loyal opposition, somebody who is going to push against you in certain ways? Is it, is it at this point or at any point in that particular narrative, and I feel like I'm using the word narrative too much, is it ever going to be proper for critical inquiry to take place, to, to ask certain uncomfortable questions about various different crime rates, about various different behaviors, about the likelihood of various different people performing various different acts that end up damaging the community. When do we get to a point where we are all released from the bondage of race? And is entering into that racial transaction of submitting myself to the white man, submitting himself to the people of color, when does that actually dissolve? When do we ever get released from this morality play? I don't think that we are released in the, by the morality play, through the morality play. There is no ultimate freedom from that oppression, anti-oppression dynamic by entering into me perceiving myself and acting as a white man and perceiving and, and, and treating people as people of color. That that in and of itself will lead to increased tensions, will lead to increased, um, increased strength of these categories, and will end up... And we will all end up 10 years from now in the same position. The civil rights discourse, the civil rights um, mythos needs to go a uh, fundamental alter, uh, needs to be fundamentally altered. And the burden of the human transaction of one human treating another human as a human being needs to rest solely in the arms of the individual and the individuals involved in that. And building up from individuals seeing themselves as individuals into eventually groups of individuals seeing each other as groups of, of individuals. That is what I perceive and I champion as the ultimate um, solution to the problem.
I don't think uh, reinforcing these categories is going to release us from these categories. Those are my thoughts. Talk to you later.